computer revolution and arrival of the commercial internet wasn't so bright for everybody. Some people were fighting in the front lines of a battle for the control of the digital realm. It was a battlefield full of police raids, corporate propaganda and hacker revolt. Constitution didn't apply to cyberspace. There was no freedom of speech, no protection from unreasonable search and seizure. At the dawn of the information age, access to computer technology was still very much restricted and some people wanted to keep it that way. But they were fiercely opposed by people who believed access to computers and information should be as free and open as possible. These two sides were engaged in a digital dirty war over access to the computer power. In the beginning, the internet used to be heavily decentralized, which allowed for greater redistribution of information and computer power. For big telecommunication corporations, this was a problem. They needed technology development to be proprietary and hidden for the sake of dominant market position. It also made it much more difficult for governments to control the public opinion and track social movements hidden behind computer terminals. More than anything, both governments and corporations feared hackers people who believed access to computer technology should be free and open. They were determined to break through those restrictions of corporate dominance and government control. Before the internet became mainstream, the battlefield was taking place in bulletin board systems. A bulletin board system, or a BBS, was a place of online meetups where people could upload and download content, exchange messages and emails, or read news and boards. They were also used by hackers to share information and knowledge about hacking and computer systems. But they were also frequented by folks and even experts from the telecommunications industry. And sometimes these experts didn't like what those boards shared about them. On a Thursday morning, March 1st, 1990, the United States Secret Service, accompanied by AT&T security officials, raided the business of Steve Jackson Games, a popular publisher of role-playing box games, Despite the fact they had never done anything illegal or suspicious, the raid happened because an AT&T crime expert didn't like the people who frequented SJG's bulletin board. Agents of the Secret Service seized all of the working and computer equipment, which prevented SJG from conducting the business for several months. No one from the SJG was charged or arrested. And later on, the Steve Jackson Games even won a lawsuit against the US Secret Service for a wrongful raid and invasion of privacy. But the raid on Steve Jackson Games was only one of many during the hacker crackdown. An 18-month-long campaign of the US Secret Service raids and vaguely warranted searches and seizures of hundreds of businesses and homes across the United States. This is a story of people for whom cyberspace was a war zone. One busy morning, security officials at Indiana Bell received a very strange phone call. An adolescent voice, boasting about his hacking powers, threatened to crash their national telephone network. He said they planned to do it together with his friends from the Legion of Doom on July 4th, 1989. He hangs up, and Indiana Bell rushes to inform the Secret Service. It isn't hard for them to track down the caller's location. It's a 16-year-old boy based in Indiana who goes by the name of Fry Guy. The Secret Service would then install pen register on his phone lines to collect metadata from his incoming and outgoing phone calls. They would find proof of a long list of Fry Guy's criminal activities. But the secret agents also got something much more valuable. A lead on three Atlanta-based members of the Legion of Doom. Urvile, Prophet and Leftist. Fry Guy met with the Atlanta 3 only through online hacker boards, where hackers commonly exchange their knowledge and experience. By teaching Fry Guy about computer intrusion, no one from Irvile, Prophet or Leftist knew they were digging their own graves. Fry Guy cared more about his self-gain than he cared about his friends and the hacker culture. By the time Secret Service began following him, he would pile up an extensive criminal record. Among many of his illicit activities, Fry Guy once hacked into local McDonald's records and gave his friends working there illegitimate raises. He also found it amusing to redirect calls of Palm Beach County probation to a sex worker. He didn't get caught, so he stepped up his game. In December 1988, Fry Guy started targeting Western Union. He would steal their customers' credit card credentials and then social engineer employees to ask for cash by posing as a legitimate client. He didn't get caught for whole seven months and would steal $6,000 this way. And that's when the weight of Fry Guy's success snapped his 16-year-old brain and he made that bragging phone call to Indiana Bell. 
getting attention from federal agents would also put the Legion of Doom in jeopardy. The Secret Service installed pen registers on phone lines of Prophet, Leftist and Irvile. On July 22, 1989, the federal agents from the Secret Service, accompanied by police and Bell security officials, raided the homes of the Atlanta 3 and Fry Guy. These raids turned out to be a goldmine for the Secret Service. The Legion of Doom thought they had done nothing wrong. Fry Guy, however, was a wicked coward. While all four of them agreed to cooperate fully, Fry Guy did something more. Being the only elephant in the room who actually stole money, he blamed all of his corrupted intentions on the Atlanta 3. Fry Guy agreed to testify against the Legion of Doom. The Secret Service would then use his long list of criminal charges to describe activities of Legion of Doom in a public propaganda. But the Legion of Doom was a totally different breed than Fry Guy. For the Legion of Doom, hacking was a crusade for open access to the computer revolution. They didn't have criminal intent. They did indeed intrude computer networks. But they never crashed or stole anything. Even if they obtained a proprietary software, they would never try to make money off of it. It was their philosophy as hackers. They believed corporations and governments shouldn't restrict access to computer technology and that it should be as free and open as possible. This is why one of the most frequent victims of early hackers were companies like Apple or Big Telco Industry, who liked to claim an monopoly on wisdom despite the fact they built their successes on the backs of someone else. This stigma between Apple and true hackers continues to this date. Needless to say, intentions of the Legion of Doom didn't really matter to the law enforcement. Cyberspace wasn't attractive only for hackers and telco industry. It was a vast new area where the government could expand their powers too. For law enforcement agencies, including the Secret Service, cracking down on hackers, malicious or not, was a matter of bureaucratic politics. They wanted higher budgets and thus needed to persuade Congress. For the security service, the Legion of Doom was their scapegoat. They had an underground hacking group who promised to break the rules and fry guy crimes to prove their point. Raids on the Atlanta 3 also reveal the true face of who is on which side. In all three raids, Agents of the Secret Service were accompanied by corporate security officials from Bell South. They were the ones who determined the guild of the Legion of Doom. They estimated a price tag of their intrusions and the Secret Service would take it at face value. It was Bell security officials primarily who decided what would be seized and worth the investigation. It was as if corporations and government acted inseparably as one body. At the time, none of the Atlanta 3 were arrested or charged, but the raid on Prophet would give the Secret Service a crucial lead to hunt down the rest of the Legion of Doom. Prophet was in possession of a proprietary document he obtained while breaking into Bell South's centralized automation system in early September 1988. Shortly referred to as E911, it was a 12-page long non-technical document describing Bell's emergency response system. Prophet didn't damage or delete anything from the Bell system. He took E911 as a mere trophy. He wanted to boast with his hacker skills, so he sent a copy of E911 to Night Lightning, the editor of a popular hacker magazine, Frag, where they decided to publish the document. Being too scared of the consequences, Prophet and Night Lightning edited out all of the identifiable or potentially sensitive information, essentially shortening the document by half. On February 25, 1989, Night Lightning published the heavily edited E911 in FRAC. However, before Night Lightning even obtained E911, Bell South officials had already known about it. Prophet made a backup of E911 on Jolnet board run by Richard Andrews. Andrews examined the E911 and decided to pass it to his friend working as an AT&T communications specialist. Being suspicious, Andrews' friend then forwarded the document to Jerry Dalton from AT&T Corporate Information Security and a US Secret Service advisor. Dalton consulted with Henry Klupfel, a Belcar expert on telecommunications fraud, what to do. Klupfel determined the incident doesn't deserve their attention and decided to put it aside for the next 16 months, until a nerve-wracking event would suddenly change their position. It's Monday afternoon, January 15, 1990. An AT&T's long-distance telephone switching station in Manhattan crashed. Nothing too out of the ordinary. Telephone networks are expected to have blackouts. Earthquakes, floods, fires or winds can all easily break parts of the system. This time, however, was different. 
Station after station across the United States, telephone switches began to crash one after another. 60,000 people lost their telephone service and 70 million phone calls went uncompleted. This crash was unprecedented and no one knew why it happened. One thing was clear, it wasn't due to a physical damage. For the law enforcement, this was a proof of a danger they've been longing for. The crash was too big to be blamed on natural causes. There must have been someone behind it. The law enforcement already had someone like that. Hackers. They were preparing for a war against hackers and all they needed now was just a spark. The crash of AT&T network that happened on the Martin Luther King Day appeared way too coincidental to be just an accident. The Secret Service wouldn't hesitate to crack down on their scapegoat. The first to fall prey to the insidious beast was Night Lightning. Three days after the crash, he was visited by Secret Service agents Foley and Golden, along with Bell security officials. They would search his house and accuse Night Lightning of the crash. When that didn't work, as Night Lightning had no idea why they were associating him with the crash, Foley confronted him about the E911 document. Night Lightning would handle the Secret Service a complete run of frack and would agree to cooperate fully. He was to be in deep trouble for possessing the document, which the Bell security officials estimated to cost $79,449. A day later, Night Lightning was indicted for interstate transfer of a stolen property. The Secret Service continued the manhunt on the Legion of Doom or anyone associated with them or the E911 document. On January 24th, the Secret Service raided homes of another three members of the Legion of Doom, Acid Freak, Fiber Optic and Scorpion. Raid forces burst through their doors with guns drawn and would seize all of their computers, notes, audio tapes, hard disks, floppy disks, telephone answering machines and even books. When asking what they had done to deserve so much attention, they were all accused of causing the AT&T crash. It seemed very odd that the Secret Service would conduct a second raid and accuse four people for the crash that the AT&T had officially admitted to be caused by a software bug. Indeed, on January 17th, AT&T's chief executive officer Bob Allen issued a public apology. AT&T had a major service disruption last Monday. We didn't live up to our own standards of quality and we didn't live up to yours. It's as simple as that. And that's not acceptable to us or to you. We understand how much people have come to depend upon AT&T service. So our AT&T Bell Laboratory scientists and our network engineers are doing everything possible to guard against every occurrence. We know there is no way to make up for the inconvenience this problem may have caused you. Needless to say, not one of the trio, Acid Freak, Fiber Optic and Scorpion, were charged with crime or arrested. The Secret Service confiscated the frag magazine from Night Lightning, which was publicly available for free anyway, in the hopes of expanding their raiding list. The most promising case was a 28-year-old hacker by the name of Terminus. Terminus was a full-time specialist in telecommunications programming. He was once praised for his impressive computer skills in an interview by Frag. On February 1st, the Secret Service decided to raid his house in search for evidence. It turned out that Terminus was not in possession of the E911 document. However, agents found a piece of AT&T proprietary software on his computer. Terminus had been sharing it with other hackers from multiple underground nodes. Jerry Dalton from AT&T Security would evaluate the software at $300,000, a figure which every IT insider except for the Secret Service doubted. Terminus have never made nor sought to make any money from copying the software. But the Secret Service already had an excuse to raid five more people whom they suspected of possessing the software too. Three days later, Terminus was arrested and eventually sent to prison for illicit use of a piece of AT&T software. But for the Secret Service, it was a dead end because none of the the Terminus's acquaintances was charged with crime or arrested. When the raid on Terminus and his contacts didn't lead any further, the Secret Service decided to take a turn. One of the people whom Terminus exchanged some bits of information with was Richard Andrews. That Richard Andrews, who informed AT&T about a rogue E911 copy on his Jolnet board. Now it was very convenient for the Secret Service and AT&T to raid his house too. Andrews' good faith to inform a company about a possible breach resulted in having his computer equipment seized from both his home and workplace. 
Andrews, as the usual drill goes, was not charged with crime or arrested, but it started to be obvious that Prophet was the one who broke into Bell South and accessed E911. So in February 6th, Prophet, Irvile and Leftist were arrested. After the raid on Terminus, the Secret Service thought they were on track of an underground gang pirating Unix software. The Secret Service started following places Terminus frequented. One such place was Elephant Node, owned by Robert Eisenberg. Eisenberg used to be a Unix contractor for AT&T. On February 21st, the Secret Service, led by Agent Foley, searched his apartment in Austin, Texas and seized $20,000 worth of computer equipment. They pressured Eisenberg to admit he was in conspiracy with Terminus and Legion of Doom. But as it usually went, Eisenberg had no idea what they were talking about. He was just a provider of a frequently visited node by all kinds of people. The Secret Service was blaming a provider for the crimes of his users. They took his elephant node along with 800 megabytes of 1990 data of dozens of Eisenberg's innocent users as evidence. But this was another dead end. Eisenberg didn't know anything about E911 and he was not a member of the Legion of Doom. He couldn't be charged with any crime or arrested. When it seemed like this was the end of the hunt for E911, it started to become clear that the document must have circulated among hundreds of boards and nodes all over the US. One such board was the Phoenix Project, created by two hackers from the Legion of Doom, The Mentor and Eric Bloodex. After what happened to the Elephant node, Mentor decided to shut down the Phoenix Project, but it was too late. The Phoenix board wasn't just visited by hackers, but telco industry experts as well, and even by Henry Klupfel, a Belcourt telecommunications crime expert. He knew that Phoenix ran frag, had the E911 document, and was a haven for the Legion of Doom. On March 1st, Klupfel would accompany the Secret Service to raid the homes of both Mentor and Eric Bloodex. Neither of them were charged or arrested, but Mentor was employed as a managing editor at Steve Jackson Games. And as you already know, in heat of the hacker crackdown, Klupfel advised the Secret Service to raid the business of Steve Jackson Games on the same day. The raid on Mentor and Steve Jackson Games would mark the end of the hunt for the E911. But the crackdown itself could not stop at few individual cases. They needed something big, unprecedented, shocking, and many responsible people seemed to be on their side. On May 8, 1990, the Secret Service would conduct their largest crackdown yet, Operation Sun Devil. 27 search warrants, 150 agents, 16 cities across America. The Secret Service seized 23,000 floppy disks, 40 computers, 25 bulletin boards and an undisclosed amount of paper documents. Board after board, they seized computer equipment in search for evidence that was supposed to prove their point in a final message to the public. With a crackdown of this scale, hundreds must have been arrested and dozens put to jail. From all this effort, they only managed to make three arrests. But that was enough. Publicly dubbed as a crackdown on credit card fraudsters, Operation Sandoval was never meant to be about mass arrests of criminals. It was about mass searches and seizures in digital realm. That's where the police wanted to expand their power. That's the unopened door behind which was unchecked power of government surveillance. At this point, constitutional protections haven't expanded to cyberspace yet and the law enforcement wanted to prevent that from ever becoming a reality. And that was the point of the hacker crackdown. That was the point in their message. Today, the Secret Service is sending a clear message to those computer hackers who have decided to violate the laws of this nation in the mistaken belief that they can successfully avoid detection by hiding behind the relative anonymity of their computer terminals. Underground groups have been formed for the purpose of exchanging information relevant to their criminal activities. These groups often communicate with each other through message systems between computers called bulletin boards. Our experience shows that many computer hacker suspects are no longer misguided teenagers mischievously playing games with their computers in their bedrooms. Some are now high-tech computer operators using computers to engage in unlawful conduct. This message was broadcast to the press from Assistant Director of the US Secret Service Gary M. Jenkins. This is of course an obligatory part of keeping healthy public relations, but when you dissect this message, you'll see the long-term strategic goals the Secret Service laid out for the future of US law enforcement. First, 
the message warns that there is a new kind of danger. Anonymous hackers who organize on digital underground to threaten the public and even national security. Second, this danger is imminent and growing. Hackers are acquiring new skills, are very well equipped, and even infiltrate high-level positions in tech industry. And finally, the US law enforcement led by the Secret Service is the most committed to face this danger. Only they have an unparalleled experience and determination to deal with this threat and take it to the front to fight these dangerous underground hackers. If architecture of this message sounds familiar to you, that's because this very formula has been repeated in response to every major security issue by the US government until today. Replace hackers with terrorists and you got yourself perfect. Rally round the flag speech to persuade the whole nation to go to war or install a total surveillance state. You can see the same rhetoric is being used by the Russia Gate or the drug war narratives. Always create an assumption of great evil that's imminently dangerous and showcase yourself as the most capable to handle it. And soon, you'll enjoy the power to determine what's right and wrong. These narratives are carefully worded this way for a reason. They are intended to lead towards expansion of jurisdictions and allocated budgets. It's especially true for the hacker crackdown, as most people the Secret Service raided were never charged or arrested. The threat of malicious hackers the message from the Secret Service warned about was actually abysmally small. Operation Sandoval arrested only three actual credit card fraudsters, and none of the arrested hackers from the entire hacker crackdown ever damaged or deleted anything. The marketing magic of the hacker crackdown didn't work on a group of civil libertarians who were alarmed by the government's determination to crack down on computer crime without fundamentally understanding the computer technology. They realized that with the expansion of computers, civil liberties are in danger. One of them was John Barlow. He had a first-hand experience with the hacker crackdown when he was visited by FBI agents in Wyoming. They questioned him about a stolen source code from Macintosh simply because an Apple official advised FBI to go to him. Barlow had nothing to do with the Macintosh incident and this FBI visit would leave a mark on him. He got in touch with Mitch Kapoor, who also reported a similar incident. Barlow and Kapoor decided to raise funds in defense of hackers facing jail time over vaguely defined computer crimes. Their initiative quickly gained publicity. John Gilmore and Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple, provided further financial support. And that's how the Electronic Frontier Foundation was born. The first case for the EFF was the trial of Night Lightning on July 24, 1990. Nine Lightning was accused of stealing the E-901 document from Bell South. He pleaded innocent and declared his action of merely publishing the E-901 document was protected under the First Amendment. His case was investigated by Henry Klubfel. He determined the cost of the 12-page long document at $75,000 as the sum of computer equipment, resources and human labor. Klupfel also accused Night Lightning of distributing a dangerous weapon, as he argued the E911 was a roadmap to enhanced 911 system, and the court took his claims at face value. Night Lightning was facing 30 years of prison time, but Klupfel's claims had several major flaws. First of all, the cost of the document seemed way too arbitrary. The defense of Night Lightning discovered Bell South was giving this document to anyone who asked, enclosed in a catalog they were selling for mere $13. And as for Klupfel's second claim, the E911 document contained no technical details, no access codes or passwords, nothing that would help anyone break into the enhanced 911 system. The document merely described the hierarchy of personal responsibilities and as such was completely useless in breaking into computer systems. On July 27th, the case was dropped and Night Lightning was a free man. At a cost of owing over $100,000 to his lawyers, despite generous contributions by the EFF, Night Lightning case shredded the public credibility of the hacker crackdown. Nonetheless, other cases didn't end so victoriously. Prosecutors failed to prove the Legion of Doom was behind the AT&T crash in January or credit card fraud. But still, all three of the Atlanta members of the Legion of Doom were pressured to plead guilty for intrusion. Irvile and Leftist got 14 months of jail time and Prophet was sentenced to 21 months. The Atlanta 3 also had to pay a staggering $233,880 in fines. 
This is how much Bell South evaluated their computer passwords and addresses. This prize was not divided among the three, but each one had to pay the sum individually. As a sherry on top, the Atlanta Three were forbidden to use computers. The EFF protested that this punishment was unconstitutional as it would deprive their rights of free association and free expression through electronic media. Terminus was sent to jail to a year for his crime of a transferring of a Unix password trapper, again valued by AT&T at $77,000. Acid Frig and Scorpion were sent to prison for 6 months, 6 months of detention and 750 hours of community service. Fiber Optic was sentenced to a year in prison. Fry Guy, the only real thief, was sentenced to 44 months probation and 400 hours of community service. Steve Jackson Games decided to sue the US Secret Service for damages inflicted by the raid and seizure of essential business equipment. The court awarded SJG $50,000 in statutory damages and $250,000 in attorney's fees. The judge rebuked the Secret Service, suggesting they had no basis to suspect SJG of any wrongdoing. For AT&T, the hacker crackdown was a blessing. At the time of the nationwide crash in January 15, 1990, it turned out to be very fruitful that the law enforcement publicly blamed hackers for a disruption caused by a bug in AT&T software. This crash, however, wasn't the only one. In July 1, 1991, a single mistyped character in a computer software collapsed switching stations in Washington DC, Pittsburgh, Los Angeles and San Francisco. The collapse left 12 million people affected. When the New York Times reported on the incident, they still considered the possibility of a hacker sabotage. But when another crash happened two months later in September 17th, vilifying hackers proved to be a fallacy. AT&T was a laughing stock for regulators and industry competition alike. MCI, AT&T's longtime rival, capitalized on this by marketing their long-distance services for the next time that AT&T goes down. AT&T saw the hacker crackdown as an opportunity to claim monopoly over network markets, but their own inability to keep their networks stable resulted in a fiasco. At least for the time. Cracking down on hackers was a war on their ideology. Telco industry didn't like that hackers believed software should be free and open. That's not how you become a monopoly. And if their ideology attracted lawmakers, their business strategies were in jeopardy. Opening up access to computer technology would enable individuals to compete directly with big corporations and they couldn't let that happen. Allying with the Secret Service to portray telco corporations as victims of underground hacker gangs managed to achieve the desired results. It became politically incorrect to align with original hacker ideas. None of the constitutional principles extended to cyberspace. And no more than 20 years later, we learned that secret government agencies continued to collaborate with tech industry to penetrate the digital realm and take full control of the cyberspace. The true hackers still exist. People who value principles over personal loyalty are still alive. Despite the ongoing war on internet freedoms, privacy is not completely dead and freedom of speech is still breathing. These people are still hated, vilified and hunted by the coalition of corporations and governments around the world. But the fight is far from over.